My full name is Harold Kenneth Lamson, and I was born on a farm in Roberts, Wisconsin in 1927. Of course, I'm retired now, but my former uh, occupation was uh, art director. When I first met uh, Sparky, we all called him, in, uh, was it uh, April 1952, and he was, uh, he had an office just 15 feet away from my desk. He had a private office there. Well, I had gone to art school at the Minneapolis School of Art for three years. And then after that, I, I uh, worked for the Ford Motor Company. I couldn't get a job because I didn't have any experience as a commercial artist. And then I, um, after that, I worked I worked at construction there and finally got a job at art, at art instruction. I was teaching figure drawing and portrait drawing. We had many desks there and there was quite a few instructors. Each, each guy had a, each person there that was teaching had a, had a, had a desk. And we would uh, all be very busy there correcting drawings and artwork of various kinds. And we would uh, put overlays, tracing paper overlays on their drawings and correct those drawings. And then we would dictate advice to the student, and which would be picked up and taken to the uh, stenographer's department and they would they would, they would retype it and then send it back for our signature and then it would be sent to the students. And that was basically the way they handled the uh, student input there. The lessons were assigned to uh, instructors uh, that did certain things probably better than the others would do. In other words, there were some very basic things that were handled by instructors that really weren't maybe what I would consider good artists, but they're doing a good job because of the system. They had form paragraphs that would go, be interp would be inserted or merged with the, your own instruction. And uh, if you were good at drawing figures, then you'd get the lessons on the figure drawing. It was broken down into courses, classes. And just some basic drawing, and then there was some stuff about advertising. Uh, as I stated earlier, that um, my desk was 15 feet from his office door. And the door was hardly uh, never closed. So I got to meet him just talking to him generally. And then, of course, uh, we would go to coffee breaks and things and uh, talk, and I got to know him very well for the five years that I was there. We were friends. After he was syndicated, he, they actually fixed up a, a standalone building on top, or, or standalone room on top of the building that was his office. So he had a penthouse office. They called it the penthouse. Well, of course, we were all a little envious, uh, but we didn't begrudge him it because he was, he was a nice guy. He really was. Well, after, sometimes students would actually come in there in person, and he would talk to them if they were interested in cartooning, which is another aspect of his character, that he, he was very cooperative with uh, uh, the, uh, the people who ran the school to take care of people like that, because we, we had a few people that lived locally that would come in and talk to an instructor, which was ideal for, for, uh, for me. I thought that was the way it should be, but you can't do that on a correspondence school. His uh, syndication had proceeded so uh, 
rapidly and fast, and his income was rising fast. And it was at that time that the officers of the company that we worked for would start inviting him to lunch because he was getting to be kind of a celebrity. And at first he, he was kind of uh, uneasy about having and uh, a little bit shy about eating with these guys that were making so much more money than he was. And he said that uh, it finally dawned on him that he'd already passed them up. He was the richest one there. He really didn't change when he was syndicated, uh, that, uh, that I think very much. He was still the same Sparky. If, if you didn't know that he was successful, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, I don't think you'd notice the difference very, very much. He was very efficient in his time. He, he knew what he wanted to do and he did it. And it seemed rather effortless uh, for him. And of course, as he, uh, time went by, he just kept getting better and better. He, and he, he did all his comic strips, all the work himself. He didn't have any help. He wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, accept anybody else's ideas. He had strict rules for that. In fact, he would be disturbed if you tried to tell him what, something you thought would work good in one of his comic strips. When he was working on a strip, he didn't have any. He didn't seem to have any stress about it. He didn't. He didn't sit there with his brow fur, furrowed and uh, tap his fingers or anything. He just went right to work. Very disciplined and very deft with his pen. And it didn't take him long to do it. He was a very likable guy, just all around likable guy. And uh, he treated everybody with respect and they treated him with respect. He would never seem to be irritated if somebody interrupted him or tried to talk to him about something else. He would talk to us about the comic strip, but he would, would not tell us about ideas. He wouldn't talk about ideas he had for the comic strip. But he talked about comics in general, the, and the other that were published in the papers. He, uh, he had his favorites, and we always discussed that. Sparky was influenced more by the work of other cartoonists, I think, than any painter. He was a, he was a student of cartooning a very serious student of cartooning from, I think, from a much younger age. He would copy the comics and drawing. And he was always drawing when he was a young boy. As far as the painting go, as far as uh, being uh, influenced by painters, I think, I think maybe Monet was one of his favorites. I think he might have been influenced in his cartoon work from cartoonists like Al, Al Cap, Little Abner, and the Cats and Jammer Kids. He, he just liked to analyze all cartoonists. He was a student of cartooning. And that would explain his success too, I think. Sparky was an avid reader. In fact, he would spend about as much time reading as he did drawing his comic strip, which, like I, I've said before, he was very efficient with his time. When he drew a comic strip, if he had trouble with an idea, he, would, he wouldn't stay on that. He would, he would come up with a new idea. He wouldn't work it over. Schultz would uh, create his comic strip just with a few rough sketches, and he would work over, maybe he'd find something kind of comical about one of the characters, and then he'd draw something kind of comical, and then he would manage to find a story to go with it. I think that happened that way. And, and then he would sketch it on, he would do his rough sketches on a pad, and then he would put those sketches 
on the strip, actual strip of the, for the finished inking. And you just go ahead and start with this pen and put them all together and be done in no time. It's just like handwriting to them almost to draw that strip. Frida, Frida Rich had her desk right in front of mine, that, uh, that dwarf body that she had. And I, I maintain to this day that that influenced Sparky's drawing of the comic strip. Not just the, 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 the large head, because that was common in cartoons. Just the way they looked walking and, and even some of the expressions. On, Frida was very expressive through her eyes and Sparky knew how to, how to illustrate that. And the way they sat, the way she sat with her legs straight out on a chair, and then that's the way the kids in the comic strip sat out. And she would come and talk to me. She would, she would uh, put her elbow on the, on my desk. She was just the right height. That was of the arm length for her. You know, that was. And she looked just like the characters that were, on the fence, sitting, standing behind a fence and talk, when they were used in the strip. So I think that was a, in my mind anyway. I thought that was a big influence on Sparky's strip. I wanted to ask you about um, his first Rubin Award. Do you recall uh, when he won it? When he won, the, when he won his uh, Rubin Award, everybody was really happy for him. We thought, I guess we thought it reflected on us a little bit because we were all pretty good friends. It's interesting that uh, that you should bring that up because I was in uh, New York myself the day that he won that award. I was there as part of my traveling scholarship. I wasn't able to take care of that uh, when when I graduated because I was married and it just wasn't convenient for me to go at that time. So I finally got around to, to using it. And it just happens that on that day that I was there, to go through the museums and study there, that uh, he won the, he was there for the award. And I thought about trying to get a hold of him, but I thought, no, he's too busy, and uh, he wouldn't be able to talk to me anyway. And he mentioned to me, he says, how come you didn't look me up? And I said, well, I knew you were, you were really uh, being involved there because it, it, it wouldn't be possible. I think he knew that too. He understood why I didn't call him. I recall that uh, there was a group of us guys, and most of them are dead now. I think I'm the last survivor of that particular group that used to spend a lot of time with him on our coffee breaks and lunch hours. And uh, we would shoot pool. We all love to shoot pool. and and shoot the breeze. And we just enjoyed one another's company. And there was a fellow named David Ratner, who was a good artist. And George Letness, was, who was a good, very good artist. And Tony Pockernick, who was a, a, liked to draw horses. He was a good Western scene type artist. Bill Ryan and myself, and we would meet almost every day for coffee, two times a day. And we would talk about sports, and we'd talk, talk about uh, music. People, they were all people interested in music. And most of us were veterans, World War II two veterans. So we'd talk about that sometimes, but not very often. I can recall Sparky talking about one of his experiences during the war, which was unusual for him to talk about. He he was uh, sitting on a street someplace on top of a truck that had a machine gun. He was a machine gunner, 
in the infantry as a staff sergeant. And he talked about how he went to, uh, the firing started, somebody was firing upon them. And he, and he spun his machine gun around and pulled the trigger and he found out he'd forgotten to unlock the gun. I guess he obviously survived, so he recovered in time to do what he, whatever he had to do. And he lived through it. But I was uh, so impressed by the, this man who was very gentle soul, really, most of the time. Like I just had a hard time, time seeing him on a truck with a machine gun shooting at somebody. It was just bizarre. Of course, I, I, I know that happened to many people lots of times during a war, but I'm surprised that he could do that. Well, both George Lettinus and uh, Sparky were uh, admirers of classical music, and they would test one another. They would whistle certain phrases from a, some classical piece and see if the other guy could tell what it was. So that was kind of interesting to listen to those two do that. Dave Ratner liked to test me on, uh, we, he'd have prints, card prints, and he would just show little bits of it to me, showing the technique, and ask, ask if I would know what that was, which artist that was. Then he'd move on to another one. He thought I did very well at it, so I was pleased. Well, we talked a lot about news and about sports. We were all interested in sports. Of course, uh, Sparky himself was a, a good baseball player. In fact, I think he actually dreamt a little bit about trying out to, for a professional team. So he was pretty good himself. And he was also good at hockey. He liked to skate. And just generally, sports interested all of us at the time. Oh, when we would go to play pool, we would go down about a block and a half from the building we were in. And it was right across from the courthouse in downtown Minneapolis. And we'd take our lunch with us and set it alongside the pool table. And everybody would put a quarter on the, the rail. And we played uh, golf pool, which was you'd have to uh, go around the table with your ball. And when you, when you got it in there, then you could go on. If you didn't, you had to stop, and the next guy would play. So the one the left standing would, would get all the quarters. How good was Schultz at, at playing pool? It was pretty good. Yes, he was. We were all pretty good. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been competing like that. So there was a competitive nature to the group as well? Oh, yes. I, that's, that, that, uh, that was one of Sparky's... Uh, Good attributes that he, he was a real competitor. He liked to win. I think the dynamics of the group was was uh, pretty much directed from all of us. Not equally, of course. We were all different personalities. I think uh, maybe Jim Sasseville and, and uh, David Ratner were the uh, the really good conversationalists in the group. Sparky would be there uh, and always make a nice contribution. He, he was uh, interested in everything we were all interested in. Well, when, uh, when we talked about art, it was usually about what one another was doing on their own time. And we talk about uh, exhibits that were on at the time in the, in the metropolitan area. Well, we talked and exchanged jokes, of course, too. But um, you had to be careful what you, what kind of a joke you told when Sparky was there. Everybody was 
pretty much aware of that, except me, when I started. And I would proceed to tell sometimes uh, little off-color jokes. And uh, I'd see the people frowning appropriately. <laughs> I soon learned that you don't do that there. Once in a while, we would meet at the bar across the street, and we'd go and have maybe a, a couple of beers and talk. But Sparky was never in that group. Sparky went home when he was through with his job. He didn't have a, a five o'clock time to go home like we did. Uh, he would often be done earlier. He was so efficient on his, his strip work that he would he could arrive later than anybody else, and he would go home earlier than everybody else. Well, our social functions as a group uh, were, were mainly birthday parties, which, and then everybody would make, draw a cartoon for the person that was having the birthday, which was kind of interesting for all of us to see what we all did. One of the one of my uh, fondest memories of uh, Sparky would be at one of my birthday parties while I was working at Art Instruction, where we all did cartoons for one another as surprise uh, birthday gifts, and we'd all open them up, and we got a. It was a lot of fun just looking at everybody's cartoon, and he made a cartoon of for my birthday, which I treasure to this day. I wanted to talk to you and ask you about um, Schultz's view on religion and whether or not that was something that was discussed or talked about. He didn't wear his religion uh, on his sleeve, uh, to quote a tired cliche. <laughs> but he, did, he would talk about it if you asked him about it. I can recall one time there had been a, I knew he had been to a Billy Graham re, uh, revival the night before. And so I asked him, well, I asked him how, how he liked it. And I was startled to hear the words come out of his mouth. He was talking rapidly and he was, and he was quoting things that Billy Graham had talked about. And you, it, it excited him to talk about it. His voice would tremble. And he talked quite a bit at length about the sermon that he had preached. I was amazed at how much he remembered things that Billy Graham had actually said. So it was very important to him. That was a very important revival that he went to, I'm sure. I got to know uh, Joyce quite well his wife, his first wife. Uh, we used to go, uh, they'd come out to our house for dinner once and we, we were invited back to their house for dinner. And she was there many times when I'd go in the evening and shoot pool with Sparky. He had a pool, pool table, professional sized pool table in his house. For, in those times that was a sign of wealth, you know. <laughs> and we had a good time with that. Well, I think when we when we went out to dinner, the conversations would usually revolve around the children, and we didn't talk about office. We didn't talk shop. Sparky was a was a model family man. He he loved his children and he talked about them, and he was very dedicated to those kids. Um, I think he spent a lot of time with them at home. I wasn't there, of course, but he would uh, describe the cute things they do and say. And I think he got a lot of ideas from his children. He would accept those ideas. My relationship with Sparky after I left Art Instruction was rather limited. Uh, we exchanged Christmas cards for a few years, and that eventually just kind of, we just kind of drifted apart. I never talked to him or called him, and he never called me. 
I'm sure he was awful busy there in California. He started working on animation and all those things that he did. Make any artwork for Schultz? I was commissioned by, by Sparky to do a portrait of his three kids, three children. That was a Meredith, who was about the same age as, as our daughter, and Craig and Monty in one painting. And it was, it was, a, it was a living room uh, scene with them on the floor. And I, uh, I understand that the painting has kind of disappeared because I asked about it. And nobody seems to know where it is. I know it was hanging in his office. And I know that uh, there's a picture that, uh, at the, what's that, the Congressional Library? Is it the Library of Congress, right? That uh, there's a picture of the family in, the, in their living room with that painting hanging on the wall. So I know it was there. And James Sasseville, who, who was out there actually working with Sparky, said it was hanging out there. And uh, thought it looked good there. And nobody seems to know what happened to it. But I know that he, he might have had it hanging in his studio when he had a fire. And I'm assuming maybe it got damaged and they had to toss it. Sparky was a very generous man when he, when I, I when my wife and I bought, bought our first house, uh, we bought a uh, small home in North Minneapolis and it was a fixer upper, one that I could afford. Uh, the salaries that, uh, as an instructor weren't, weren't really adequate for a married man, but I, I stayed there anyway for quite a while, but, but not getting back to uh, my house. When it came time to complete the financial business of getting this mortgage, I found that I'd under, underestimated certain fees and closing costs, and that I was about over $200 short of what I needed. And I was discussing it with somebody else. He overheard it, and he came to me privately and said, uh, offered me to get, to, offered the cash to me, to, whatever it would be, to finish that mortgage on just a handshake and pay me back when you can. And I was very appreciative, appreciative of that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us and talk to, to us about Schultz. Well, I've enjoyed meeting, meeting you folks. And I'm pleased that you came to my house and got me going on this interview.